I'm so happy to see that entrepreneurship has always been a periphery of academics. And this is the session where we don't have enough chairs for people to sit. We can have a round of applause for RCEP and the ISTIM panel. So happy to see such crowd for entrepreneurship and innovation. Let me introduce the panel. We have Dr. Rajan Saxena. So I'll introduce in short uh, ex Vice Chancellor uh, Narsi Munji, Institute of Management Studies Universities and Advisor Fiki Higher Education. We have Dr. Abhay Jaide, Vice Chairman AICT, Chief Innovation Officer, Ministry of Education, the man who introduced India to hackathons, the man who is known for hackathons or people know hackathons, synonyms Abhay Jaide. Welcome, Dr. Abhay Jaide. We have Suresh from University of Sydney. We have Rose. Rosemont uh, from Ghana. We have Niharika, uh, University of Melbourne. And then we have Paul Harris, uh, Research Innovation Universities, Australia. We have a very uh, diverse panel coming uh, across the globe. And we have two key stakeholders from India who have been driving academics very innovatively and innovation in academics. Uh, with this short introduction, uh, I hand it over to the chair of the session. Dr. Rajan Saxena. Dr. Saxena, please. Well, good morning to all of you and uh, welcome to this session on uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, the transformative role of the universities in this area of entrepreneurship and innovation. As uh, Dr. Yugesh was mentioning, I'm indeed privileged to have a wonderful panel over here. Uh, policy makers, academicians who have been working in the area of entrepreneurship and innovations in different parts of this world and therefore bringing in a whole lot of an experience right over here itself. While for example, starting from my extreme right, Paul Harris has been a Paul, has been a advisor, has been a policy maker in an Australian in Australian universities itself, particularly in the area of innovation research universities itself. Hmm? Niharika, in that role, hmm. sitting next to him, has been, has been passionate about that diversity, equity, inclusiveness. And therefore, from that kind of a perspective, you can very well imagine that what we are going to be getting is a, is a very interesting perspective on the one hand, an economic perspective of entrepreneurship and on the other is the social kind of a part that we are going to be getting while Professor Rosamond really brings in a whole lot of an experience from Ghana and Professor Suresh brings in a whole lot of an experience and a passion of promoting entrepreneurship at the University of Sydney in, in Australia and of course Dr. Jere is our, is our very own Vice Chairman of the All India Council of Technical Education and has been promoting the innovation council and, and innovations and also the the hackathons that are there. We would also have a video bite from uh, Professor Amar from Satan Hall University in New Jersey that we are going to be doing it towards the end. Well folks, uh, how I intend to really stru <coughs> structure this whole thing is that uh, after my opening comments for about next five to six minutes. I'm going to be handing it over the session to the panelists. Each of them is going to be making up uh, their, their opening commands or the presentation for about seven to eight minutes. After which we will open it up for a discussion among the panelists. We, we want to have it a little bit of a conversation happening around within the panelists and I'll keep on intervening and keep on for, you know, asking some questions right out over there. After which, for about five to seven minutes, which, which we tend to do that, we will open it up for questions from the audience itself. The whole purpose is to really make it an inter interactive session rather than just simply the, 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 the long speeches and everything that are there. <coughs> That's a kind of an objective with which we are going to be starting off with. Well, folks, uh, we are aware about the fact that uh, there are four forces today that are driving change across 
the world is today demanding universities to relook at their purpose to re-examine not only the purpose but also what their mission is really all about are they just for the purposes of developing employable graduates or do they really have to be going beyond mm -hmm. the creation of an employable graduates for the industry to development of value creators and wealth creators in the economy itself. Personally, I feel that, you know, these four forces, that is the technology, the demography, the socioeconomic changes in the in, in any nation, and also for that matter, the government policies, and combine that with the public health emergencies that we have just seen, the pandemic, has opened up a whole lot of an opportunities. Today we find these opportunities in almost every sector of the economy. It is, and these opportunities to innovate and to create solutions which are more relevant for the society, for the, for the, for the, for the, for the nation, is something that we can really see it happening around. Some of the more recent kind of uh, developments, for example, and innovations that have happened, for example, have been in the area of delivery, for example. Take an example like the delivery. And the way, for example, the delivery have been, have changed, bringing and really getting down towards the bottom of the pyramid, bringing in people from, the, from, from that particular community to come in as the delivery agents or delivery partners is something which is a phenomenal kind of a, of, of, a, of, a, of a development itself. Or for that matter, now today with the 3D printers out there and, and, in, the, and, and in the design schools, we realize that one doesn't have to be going in only for what we call it as the same kind of a raw material to produce a product. Today, one is able to really produce a product from auto solutions, from using different kinds of raw materials, different kind of inputs, and therefore look at it from the that they can hold on to the cost, they can improve on the efficiency, and certainly they, they can really have the products which are which which can be created in a much shorter time period than what traditionally have ever been possible itself. I also feel that uh, the entrepreneurship and startup era, which is uh, which is just which which is which which we do find today as mm -hmm. being right there in in India, and uh, uh, the government of India has created that kind of a of an of an environment for the startups itself. Uh, today we find a large number of graduates wanting to not join a corporate, but to get on to a startup. Now, getting on to a startup, either for work or for that matter, as one of the co-founders, or getting on in terms of a some kind of a of of of, an, of some role within the startup is primarily with the view that at some point of time or another in the career, they would want to do, they want to get into the startup area itself. So the startups have today gained, and these are not just in businesses, but they are also in a whole lot of a social sector itself. I mean, for example, motorized uh, plows, for example, or for that matter, the uh, mobile renal therapy itself that we saw coming up during the pandemic, which at one stage it was what was impossible for the for the patient suffering from kidney and, and for the dialysis that they, they could go in for dialysis because of the lockdown conditions that were there. And to resolve that, you have such something which is called a mobile kind of a dialysis machines that were there and that, that people could possibly rent and then turn it back. <clears throat> These are the, the solutions that have come up from the universities. 
And why I say that is because, and this is where I come to the point, that the universities is the place where such kind of transformation can really happen, where such kind of innovations can happen. Think of a university like the Moises, for example, or NMIMS, or, or let's say the IITs itself. Almost every discipline that you see is there. And if the fact that these universities have a multidisciplinary, it provides an opportunity to create solutions which are embedded in multidisciplinary part of it, interdisciplinary itself, and therefore become more relevant itself. Innovation has to be the goal of the university today, and therefore creating an innovation ecosystem has to be the goal of the university. Some universities, particularly those that have, that have been there outside, have created what they call it as an industry box. Like an IIT Madras, for example, has created the industry park. Now that is some possibly a way where it is not just the innovation centers, but also it's an industry that, that is working on their problems and students get an opportunity to work on those kinds of problems and create some innovative solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll hold on to now my comments, otherwise, you know, a typical kind of a part that happens is that we, we don't pay regard for the time for the others. So I am going to be passing it on to the person on my extreme right, Paul Harris. Uh, and, uh, and I'd like you, Paul, to, to talk about your experiences in the area of innovative research universities in Australia. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you to the organisers from Symbiosis for a fantastic conference. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Paul Harris. I'm from the Innovative Research Universities Group in Australia. We're a group of seven young research universities. Um, I'm just going to talk about three things. I'm going to try and keep it brief so that we have lots of time for discussion and questions. Um, I'd like to give you a quick overview of our universities and how we think about innovation in the Australian system. Um, a quick overview of our national policy debate about innovation and entrepreneurship in universities. And then finish with just a few thoughts, the perspective of our universities about where we think we might need to go into the future. So we are a group of universities in Australia that was established first in the early 1970s and then expanded in the 1980s and 90s. And really our mission was to expand access to higher education, particularly for underserved groups in Australian society as the population in our cities grew. And we brought to this task a real focus on innovation both in teaching and in research. So in the 1970s, our universities were famous for these sort of interdisciplinary courses, very progressive approach to education. And we also have always had a really strong focus in our universities on <coughs> research and applied research, which is delivering an impact for our communities. Um, today, in our seven universities, 50% of our students are the first in their family to attend university. We've had a doubling of research output over the last decade and our engagement and collaboration with industry partners has increased by 260% over the last decade. So we see this as a real success story of the Australian university system, this expansion of quality research and expansion of, of access. Um, and really the, at the core of the mission of our universities is thinking about how do we bring together that commitment to access and equity and a commitment to innovation. And what does it look like when you bring equity and innovation together? Um, we have great examples from our seven universities across the country of innovation and entrepreneurship activities. I'll just give you one in the interest of time. Flinders University in Adelaide has set up an innovation precinct called the Tonsley Innovation Precinct. And this is an incredible story of universities working together with um, technical and vocational education colleges industry partners, startups, venture capital to develop a real innovation ecosystem in Adelaide in South Australia. The site of this innovation precinct was actually vacant because factories and companies had closed down and moved away and there was 
vacant land and the university and the technical college moved in together and they've created a real innovation ecosystem which is thriving today and it's a partnership between all the different parts of the tertiary education system, industry partners, state government, federal government, capital funding. And actually now what we're seeing in this innovation park is the same kinds of companies that moved out 20, 25 years ago, reinvesting with the universities for different kinds of collaboration and innovation. So there's these real success stories across Australia. But, and this is my second theme, even with these successes and this expansion of collaboration, the overwhelming narrative, I think, in Australia is that universities need to do a better job of working with industry. And we've had a real focus from our federal government on this particular issue. In 2022, our government announced a huge funding injection into the university sector, which was specifically focused on commercialisation and entrepreneurship. Um, it includes a range of programs, including an economic accelerator, increased venture capital funding, university industry hubs. We have a new student entrepreneurship program called Startup Year, which gives an opportunity for 2,000 additional students to participate in sort of entrepreneurship and startup activities. And this is really driving a lot of work between universities and government and industry partners in Australia. And this is going to be something that will continue to roll out over the next few years. The reason, I think, for this big investment by our federal government is because there is a sense that even though we have seen these successes across the country and we have real research strength, particularly in basic fundamental research in our universities, we still are not performing as well as other countries when it comes to research commercialization and innovation. So this is a real live debate in Australian universities at the moment with our industry partners, with our government. And I just wanted to conclude with four thoughts on what this means for where we go from here. This is the perspective of our universities, um, the innovative research universities in Australia. And when we talk with industry partners or with government, these are the kind of messages we're trying to convey. The first is that in our focus on innovation and entrepreneurship, we have to also maintain a focus on equity. We don't want innovation that makes inequality worse than it already is in our society. And we need to think about the access and equity for students, and researchers into these programs and the kinds of impacts that these new activities are delivering in the economy and in society. The second point that we would make is that we need to think about not just the economy and productivity today, but also productivity and innovation into the future. And that requires, I think, a balanced investment. Yes, we need to invest in industry collaboration and commercialization, but we also need to make sure we don't lose the investment in fundamental research, which is going to generate the ideas and the technologies and the innovation 10, 20, 30 years down the track. We also would argue that we need a very interdisciplinary approach to how we think about innovation and entrepreneurship. And it was really heartening on the first day of the conference to hear all of the students talking about this. They want that interdisciplinary education. And we need to think about how to provide that for them. We in our universities have this tradition of interdisciplinarity, but I think we need to reinvent that for the 21st century and think about that in new ways. In Australia, our National Government Productivity Commission has just issued its big five-year report on the future of productivity in Australia. And it, it really raises lots of important issues for universities in our country to think about. But they make the point that the changing nature of the economy in Australia means that we are going to have to have different kinds of innovation into the future. And it's really interesting from our main economic policy agency in Australia to have this message that it's not just about STEM skills, but it's actually about how do we bring together different disciplines, different perspectives and different knowledges for different kinds of innovation. And that's a challenge I think we all have to grapple with. And my final point is that I think we're also going to need to think about global collaboration in new ways. We have in Australia a very highly internationalised university system which delivers huge benefits both to our society and to our partners in other countries. But I think we are going to have to recognise that global innovation is changing quickly and coming here and visiting with you and learning more about the Indian system is a real eye-opener for us in Australia, I think. But 
the system globally is changing and we have great connections internationally, but we have to make sure that we don't just assume that they will stay the same forever. We're going to have to partner in new ways. And I think a conference like this is a fantastic way of building that dialogue. So thank you. Thank you, Paul, <clears throat> for bringing out some pretty relevant kind of issues, particularly with regard to access and equity. But also in terms of the innovation system, partner is partnership with almost every player within the ecosystem. And third, is in the area of productivity and innovation in future, which is a very, very relevant issue for, for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And I'm very going to be coming back to you. Let's hear from uh, the, the Ghana experience from Professor Rosemont. Professor Rosemont. Good morning, everybody. And I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share experiences from Ghana. I'm going to look at the issue uh, from the angle of the three core mandates of every university. We have teaching, research, and extension services, or others will call it outreach. And in my university, we are looking at infusing entrepreneurship in all these three core mandates of uh, the university. When we look at the situation in Ghana, every year, most of the universities churn out about 110,000 students. But out of this 110,000 students, you have less than 5% securing jobs. So you get a lot of young people complaining, calling you, I'm not getting jobs. And we thought, what is the relevance of a university? We need to sit down and reassess our position in helping our economies and in also in transforming our society. So right from the word go, we have incorporated entrepreneurship in our vision, our mission, and our core values. What we are doing currently is that we are re-evaluating our curriculum and we are incorporating 21st century skills in every program that we have in the university. That is entrepreneurship, creativity, innovation, digital skills, uh, collaborative, uh, uh, citizenship. We want to be able to churn out students. I, I don't want to say, people will argue that you don't want to say we are churning out students for industry, but we are churning out students who will be able to be agents of change in the community in which they find themselves. So we have introduced a program uh, that is what we call the university-wide entrepreneurship course. And the aim is just to develop the entrepreneurial mindset, the entrepreneurial skills, and even the entrepreneurial behavior of our students. We've not only ended there, although we are giving them that entrepreneurial mindset, entrepreneurial skills, we've also establish what we call the design thinking and innovation hub. So those who go through the program, they've developed the, the idea and they think that they want to move it further. Then they go to the design thinking and innovation hub. And what we do is that we help them to develop their ideas, nature and grow those ideas and turn them into viable businesses. And usually I tell people that entrepreneurs do not necessarily have to own resources. They can use other people's resources. So when we get to a point and realize that we don't have enough resources to support the students, we tend to partner with organizations or sometimes the government to be able to help the young ones. So we don't work with only our students. We work with the young ones and work with people in the community. We've worked on projects that looks at the value chain in electronic waste, where you look at people discarding ways how they can recycle them. We also look at projects in the circular economy. And what we are currently doing is that we are collaborating with Cosmos, uh, that's an uh, uh, oil exploration company. And we are focusing on Agric, because if you come to Ghana, Agric contributes about 54% to our GDP. So we are looking at the agriculture value chain. And their project is creating Agritech. So we are looking at the input, the output, and we are even looking at technologies 
that will help the farmers to be able to produce and preserve their products. So currently we have students who have developed uh, an ICT tool that will help the farmers to test soil, the, the nature of the soil. We have students who are using the black soldier fly. Uh, they are using it as protein. So they breed them and use them as protein and they are using them to feed uh, fish, aquaculture and poultry. So as at now we have about 30 businesses that some have been supported and others we are looking for funding to be able to produce the, the, the products or services that they've come up with. What we've also done is that when you look at the way we teach entrepreneurship, most of us who teach the entrepreneurship don't even have businesses. So we don't even have the experience. But what we've done is that those of us, though we, well, I have PhD in entrepreneurship, I also happen to own a software company with my husband where we develop software for schools and I'm a farmer. So I also I tell the students I'm a professor who is a farmer and we are developing the coconuts. You know, coconut, the value chain, you can use the, the uh, water, you can use the husk to develop briquettes for fuel instead of people cutting trees. So what we've done is that we've encouraged all the lecturers who are handling the program to be entrepreneurs themselves. So that when they are sharing, they are, they are mentoring and they are coaching the students, they are sharing their experiences uh, with them. And what we've also done is because we are lecturers and we may always not get the time to mentor and coach the students, we've established what we call the entrepreneurial fellows. So with entrepreneurial fellows, we look for people in industry. So currently we have a CEO of, of a venture capital trust fund, and she's a lady. We've specifically selected her so that she will help the businesses in the greater identify sources of funding. And at the end of the day, if they need funding, they will be able to get the support from her. So we've selected quite a number of business people, and they are the entrepreneurial fellows, and they are supporting the faculty and business leaders in mentoring and coaching these entrepreneurs. Then we are also looking at academic entrepreneurship. We have, so we are not focusing on only students. We also focus on the lecturers and the people in the community. We have lecturers who have developed lasers that can uh, detect breast cancer. But initially, they didn't even know they have to get the intellectual property and patent them. So we are supporting them with the research department to be able to patent that product. We have lecturers who have developed products that can detect food fraud. So for instance, rice, they will be, uh, that, that, that the software can detect whether this is proper rice or this rice is contaminated. And we are helping them as part of the hub for them to patent their products. We are doing all these things to make sure that at the end of the day, we inculcate, we inculcate that spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation in our lecturers. Then finally, I'm going to look at the third aspect. So I've mentioned the teaching, the research, and extension services. How do we impact the communities? If you come to where my university is, we are surrounded by seven villages. And most of the people in that village have not taken advantage of the presence of the university. So how do we do that? What we've done is we've developed a community model. So the faculty of education, and I'm talking about entrepreneurship here, we are bringing about change. We've adopted the poor schools who are not able to match up when it comes to the national exams. So we have professors and lecturers, and what we are doing is we are using the students as volunteers to go and mentor these young ones and these schools so that they'll also be able to match up. Then they'll be able to have more of their products entering the university. And we are also coming out with a football academy, a reading club, all aim at making sure that we impact the communities in which we operate as a university. So in this instance, when we are looking at transformation, we are not focusing on only the curriculum and the teaching aspect. We are also looking at research and we are also looking at extension services. And to summarize my, my, my presentation, what we are aiming at as a university and as a design thinking hub is what we call impact investment. Whilst we are encouraging our students to come up with products, we, we are encouraging them to come up with, with products 
that is not going to harm the environment or that is also not going to contribute to climate change. So in all these instances, we are looking at sustainability. How do we sustain our environment? How do we sustain our society at the same time making money and generating or creating jobs for others? So in a nutshell, this is what we are doing at the University of Cape Coast. And I'll leave uh, the rest if there are questions or uh, I'll, I'll be prepared to answer them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Quite uh, a very relevant kind of a perspective that uh, we get from Ghana uh, in the area of agriculture, for example. And uh, why I say that and why I find that a, a very relevant, because if we were to look at India also, a lot of innovations and innovative solutions are required in agriculture area to, to bring the products and services to the, to the farmer is also bringing their products and their produce to the market itself and create a value-added kind of a, of, a, of, of, a, of a value chain right there, a value chain that will, that will lead towards a value creation in the, in the rural area is something that we all need to be looking at. And another wonderful idea that uh, Professor Rosamond made was in terms of the fact that those who are teaching entrepreneurship are also entrepreneurs. Now, this is interesting because uh, this is a model that uh, we don't have it. But nonetheless, I think if uh, some of us really understand the, what it takes to create an enterprise and also, you know, take it up onto the growth path, I'm sure you would be one of those mentors who would be most sought after by the startups itself. Wonderful listening to you, Professor Ro uh, Rosamond. I'll move towards something else. You know, we, we've heard two perspectives over here in the area of entrepreneurship. Before I really bring in my very, very interesting friend from University of Melbourne in it, I'm going to bring my friend over here who's a policymaker, who's a, who sits there in the, in the hallowed office of the AICTE as a vice chairman. And, uh, and I know for sure that, you know, a lot of us from the universities must have been dealing with his office for many, many things. I've, as a vice chancellor, I would have also somewhere or the other interface with the AICTE, although uh, not really directly through, but actually my registrar would have possibly interacted and stuff like that. So let's, let's hear from uh, Dr. Abhay Jere. Dr. Jere, you have been heading the Innovation Council. You have also been involved in hackathons. And uh, it's a one big area where you do find companies coming forward with innovation challenges to the universities. And students getting excited about that, coming up with those kinds of uh, solving those problems, coming up with those innovative solutions. So Dr. Jere, would you like to tell us about what you do and also in terms of some of these innovation challenges and the hackathons and, and how much they have been able to contribute towards creating solutions which are absolutely relevant for the Indian economy? First, Sakshana sir, thank you for giving me this opportunity. I would also like to thank Symbiosis for inviting me here. And of course, I would like to thank the wonderful crowd which is here. Sakshana sir introduced me as Vice Chairman AICT. But before joining, taking over Vice Chairman AICT, I was the Chief Innovation Officer. I am still the Chief Innovation Officer for Ministry of Education, Government of India. I don't know how many governments across the world have Chief Innovation Officer. Indian government has that. So you can understand the impetus, the emphasis which Indian government gives for innovation and entrepreneurship. 
if you just look at some of the matrices matrices then in 2014 india was ranked 81 on global innovation index and now we are 40 so we have jumped considerably however <laughs> however it this ranking still doesn't do justice to our true potential and internally we have set a target of how we can become uh, top 10 global innovation destinations in next 5 years so that is what the internal discussions are going on so this is the way and that is the pace at which indian government is determined to push the entire ecosystem within the country and when we are looking at this ecosystem or building this ecosystem our biggest stakeholders are universities because they have to emerge as innovation hubs fountain heads of innovation and from that perspective government of india is doing multiple initiatives and very systematic initiatives so when i took over as a, a chief innovation officer one of the things which i realized is that when people are sitting on such a dais they think they talk big things you know and they just throw around buzzwords innovation startup entrepreneurship you know but when you ask them in private okay what exactly you are doing <laughs> it's pretty hollow yeah. and they will give you some hush hush answers and that's where we started to realize that rather than just uh, playing around this buzzwords we have to systematically handhold our institutions so that a sustainable ecosystem can get created and that is the reason we actually conceptualized iics which we called as institution innovation councils there is no such model globally present okay mm. so we now have iics in more than 7500 institutions out of which i can proudly say about 5200 are really function really doing that and what we are doing through these iics is that on monthly basis or on uh, quarterly basis we are telling institutions to do a certain event or a program or an initiative and what we are telling them is that if you will do it systematically the way we want it then eventually we will ensure that in couple of years or three years a sustainable ecosystem will get created then you don't require us and we will move on and i'm very happy to share with you is that in last three and a half years or so even if we remove this pandemic period through these iics we have conducted 150000 programs big and small 150000 programs big and small related to innovation entrepreneurship startup so which involves lot of uh, workshops involves big sessions for going hunting problems then sessions for actually concretizing on those problems doing idea competition around those problems then building prototypes then taking those prototypes to different through different trl levels once it reaches a particular trl level then how it can be incubated and then the incubation ecosystem should take it forward you know so it's a very systematic program which we have tried to develop so once when we started first year because there was no such initiative at the level uh, we got a lot of feedback we are still failing on some of the things we are still working reinventing the wheel or repivoting or pivoting what we can call you know but it's a home grown model and when we talk about workshops and those kind of things we talk about we push institutes to get into design thinking to do 
uh, workshops related to IPR management and so on and so forth. So there is, there is, there are, there is a, what we can say, a bouquet of activities uh, which we push institutions to do. Another initiative which we started was innovation ambassador training program. Because what we realized was that who kills ideas? Ideas get killed by elders at home and teachers or faculty members in school, colleges. Yeah? Don't talk big. How, may, how much grades you have got? What are the marks you have got? That kind of thing. Especially in Indian society, where there is too much importance for marks and grades. Yeah? We, are, we are told that uh, don't get involved in all other nonsense, just focus on getting grades. You know? uh, so we said, okay, we have to do something about it. And uh, we went ahead and we actually trained, till date we have trained about 25,000 faculty members as innovation ambassadors, out of which 15,000 are from schools. Because you cannot, you means you ca can kill the creativity in school and then you cannot expect that student to do great when he is doing uh, his higher education. And there also, the modules are very, very well designed. So first module is on design thinking. The second module is on IPR management. The third module is on actually how to handhold an idea at a pre-incubation level or an incubation level. Then some aspects related to business plan development and so on and so forth. How to register the startup. So that we should have on-ground change agents in schools and in colleges. Because as I said, People go to these conferences, talk back, and then next day come home, go to a class, and within two days they are back to normal. Right? Yeah. So that we have to have on ground change agents. And then also, there also we felt that we cannot have one or two. Because if we train just one or two, other people gang up against them. Yeah? So, and try to kill the ideas which the other person is putting. So we said at least three or four people should be there. There has to be some seed, you know, that around the, around which, or the nucleus around which that crystal can get created. So that is uh, another initiative. And and the initiatives what we are doing is at a scale. Because in India, scale matters. I, I currently have around 8,000 institutions under me right now. And all technical institutions, engineering colleges, deemed to be universities. So, that is, now I don't know how many of you will be aware, we have introduced design thinking in sixth standard. It's an elective which CBSC has got. India is the first country to do it. The books are already out from sixth standard to twelfth standard. About thousand schools have actually started giving design thinking as an elective from sixth standard. We have trained 1500 teachers, school teachers, just on how to teach design thinking at school level. So, you, you should actually push some of your kids to uh, explore how it can be done. And finally, I, I can just talk for two hours what things are doing. But finally, I will uh, mention one very interesting initiative. And then we can get into other discussions. So we actually, about three years back, we conceptualized a program called as uh, MBA in Innovation, Entrepreneurship and Venture Development. And we took seed from some of the initiatives like Symbiosis is doing or a couple of other institutions are doing. You know? And the primary objective uh, for that program was, again, based on our Indian DNA, Indian society. You know? Uh, it happened that a large number of youngsters came to us saying that we want to pursue entrepreneurship. We want to pursue uh, innovation and take our ventures forward. But our parents, our boyfriends, girlfriends are not allowing us. You know, uh, they say, uh, they are saying, why you want to go through this magajmari, you know, of, because entrepreneurship is 48 hours a job a day, you know. It's quite a, it's, a, it's quite a, it's a tedious thing. Uh, so, can you do something about it? And they want us to take a good job, enjoy Netflix, chill, you know, that kind of a thing. So we said we have to do something about it and we started this initiative. 
it's a conventional uh, it's not a conventional mba although it is called as mba it's an incubator based mba where uh, the classroom component is only 30% currently we are doing pilot in 20 institutions but what we are trying to do here is that we are trying to admit students as teams under this mba and under the garb of mba actually they will pursue entrepreneurship so you can tell your parents or your parents can tell someone else that my son is doing or my uh, uh, daughter is doing mba in entrepreneurship venture but under the garb of that mba you actually pursue entrepreneurship very systematic and again uh, we have got quite a okay response for that i would not say we have got fantastic response for it because we are also evolving uh we started in four institutes and now uh we have about 20 institutes actually offering this program but because of all these micro initiatives now we have more than 70000 startups out of which we have around 25 30000 startups which are student led startups or faculty led startups and i was just couple of weeks going back to the valuation of the student and faculty led startups and it was around combined valuation was around 2 billion dollars so that is what our students while studying and faculty while teaching they are doing it so i think uh, although we have long way to go but yes the systems are evolving in the right direction and discussions like these actually help us create a community which will push us further in that direction thank you thank you very much thank you thank you dr jode and uh, very rightly said that in terms of doing some work on the ground that is more relevant than just simply having some papers or some presentations and those kinds of things and which is where you know comes a perspective from somebody who has been work who has had a wonderful experience of of being a chief scientist life sciences and r&d head for persistent systems limited before he really came in as the chief innovation officer at the at the ministry of hrd so thank you very much Uh, Dr. Chair, let me turn towards uh, Dr. Niharika Garu, uh, who is going to be presenting to us uh, a very different perspective in the area of DEI, the diversity, equity, and and uh, inclusiveness, and how she connects it for the in the in the area of entrepreneurship. I think. that is something which is going to be pretty useful and this is largely relevant especially when we look at it when we look at our own country where there is there are very various challenges and one of them is really that of how do we create an inclusive models of economic growth or an inclusive model of innovation itself dr garu Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rajan, for that introduction, and thank you everybody for listening and for your time today. Uh, it's heartening to see that the room is full, and all of you are still awake, so <laughs> that's good to see. Um, thanks to the organizers as well for organizing this panel because I think this is a very important and timely conversation for uh, not just uh, universities in India or Australia, but around the world. Um, we know that we are becoming more and more global. the boundaries are getting more blurred if you are starting up your venture you are able to now reach out to people in silicon valley or other parts of the world to connect to um, start working with so it's important to talk about entrepreneurship without the boundaries um so let me start um let me start talking about a few things which i think all of us um should keep in mind when we talk about creating programs or initiatives with regards to innovation and entrepreneurship um whether it's in our universities or um with our students um it's important to think about these two things the very first point is why do we need to incorporate equity diversity inclusion in our organizations and lots of research in the last 40 years has been done across the world including in india and other parts of asia um and other developing economies and the evidence is very clear 
those startups and organizations are more profitable they have more productivity they enjoy more consumers higher market shares as compared to their competition <laughs> that's the hard evidence those are the performance indicators and we know numbers don't lie so over a period of time you are likely to see a much more profitable a much more fair organization because one of the studies which came out recently um right. found that these organizations are also more honest more ethical and are better employers because they pay you fairly and they treat you fairly so this these are some of the important points to remember why should we worry about dei right, right. the second more important point and this is what dr rajan um, i think wanted me to talk about more was where is this um, um diversity equity and inclusion when we see the entrepreneurship and innovation across the globe lots of uh, countries are not talking about entrepreneurship and innovation as a national agenda uh, as a as a national agenda point including india including australia so let's look at some of the numbers and now i don't have such good news so across the world the venture capital funding available every year to um, small businesses and entrepreneurs around the world is about 32 billion 32 billion us dollars and crowdfunding has been estimated to be available every every year i'm talking about is about 1.88 billion can anybody guess how much goes to the women or minority owned startups and businesses any numbers any guesses 10% 10% did you say 10% it's 1.8% right 1.8% and what does what does this troublesome number do over a period of time imagine every year um during covid by the way this number went down below 1.5% right so now imagine this every single year for the last i don't know 60 years right so what's going to happen um people who are building our systems infrastructure our products and services people who are actually you know building innovation new things new technologies digital technologies all of those all of those things are being developed by a specific demographic what is that demographic across the world i'm saying is the white male right and in some cases it's the male uh depending on where you are if you are in brazil it's you know the white males there if you are in asia it's the is the male demographic right and a lot of you might be thinking not many women want to be entrepreneurs not many marginalized or disabled individuals want to take up entrepreneurship right why is that because the the system it doesn't allow support or educate them to go to that level where they can actually freely think about their employment options so that's where i think we need to talk about changing the system not just training a few people and leaving it to the training but changing the system for the long term impact there is this very interesting um thing that happened in 1920s new york city new york city has been the economic capital of of our you know of our civilization of our times and in 1920s the urban planner of new york city robert moses famously said that i might not be alive but the infrastructure and the bridges that i build will be here for 70 years right so they will have their own legacy what did he do in 1920s he built extremely low bridges connecting the communities which were very poor communities hispanic latino communities and other racial communities connecting them to new york city the bridges were very low what does this mean when the bridges are very low the buses the public transport and the industrial vehicles cannot pass through that bridge it cannot go through the bridge so you are essentially cutting off the marginalized community and over a period of time the poor are not able to use the public transport and they need the public transport the most they need it for their schooling they need it to get a job and and etc etc so you can imagine the impact that that the lack of dei can have when we are talking about any kind of development of products and services and and infrastructure and public goods and and i would want you to maybe think about um whatever you see in entrepreneurship and innovation in your own space to think about it from a dei point of view who are we ignoring when we are putting this new 
product out there right are we creating outsiders are we making others feel like outsiders that they don't belong right they don't have a space here so that's i think very important for us to uh, recognize across the world um, now because um, digital technologies in the last i would say 20 years you know it has picked up all of us are familiar with chat gpt and google and whatsapp and all kinds of facial recognition machine learning models that are now freely available to us um, lots of companies are using employment algorithms to you know screen your cv to hire for a position and all those digital technologies of today have found to be discriminating against women against people of color against disabled individual one recent statistic on this is from one of the major employment platforms like glassdoor and the ai that actually or the algorithm that actually um, is being used has found um, to be extremely biased towards disabled individuals who put up their cvs for jobs so now imagine for the same job when you and i have applied you have a physical di physical disability i don't you are a much stronger candidate on paper right but during the entire process of negotiation and interviewing you are found to be getting offers of starting salaries which are lower than me right how much lower do you think they might be according to the stat stats it's 50 to 75% so we are actually contributing to increasing financial inequality and wealth gap and we are actually pushing some of these um, marginalized communities and minority uh, individuals into further and further debt and poverty that has an impact on their families and their communities as you can imagine this includes all kinds of racial differences this includes all kinds of religious based communities um facial recognition technology is now being widely used we were talking about it um facial you know recognition technology has been widely used now by the police and the law enforcement to uh, control crimes cctvs are everywhere right when we were actually driving across pune we noticed that cctvs are everywhere right somebody is watching but that facial technology is 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 now it's now actually very well known that it has trouble in matching people of color with the data it has been given it has trouble in matching people of color and the problem is a lot of innocent people have gone to jail just on that evidence of facial recognition technology now just think about it for a moment what does that mean for a lot of us here a lot of us here are people of color so so we we must think about changing the system in a way where diversity equity inclusion is a part of the daily operations uh, is a part of the business is a part of what we do so when we talk about entrepreneurship and innovation training and when you talk about training others to be entrepreneurs and faculty members becoming entrepreneurs or when we talk about you know designing um systems where we have a lot of faculty members training others we must also talk about how they can create a difference when they are training others to be an entrepreneur how they can talk about product market fit segmentation targeting and position differently right these are common terminologies that we hear from startup people right we can actually talk about dei as a part of it that it is important to think about product market fit keeping in mind the the gaps that you might be creating right when it comes to diversity equity and inclusion or when you are you know keeping a prototype ready and you are about to go into the market and test it think about your segmentation targeting and positioning right from a dei point of view because you might be the one creating the outsiders you might be actually increasing the gap um and in the next 20 years if your product starts to actually take up and it starts to actually being uh, be used by millions of people the impact could be very significant so we must talk about that as a part of our responsibility as educators especially when we talk about entrepreneurship and innovation training so i would stop here uh, with that and um it would be good to continue this conversation further but thank you so much uh, thank Dr. you Ryan. thank you very much yeah. and that is uh, that is truly the crux of a lot of micro enterprise development in uh, in the institutions i'm aware of the institution which i headed 
and a man is working in this kind of a direction particularly and certainly discrimination is one of the very very uh, significant problem and in almost every society every society the discrimination could be on multiple grounds which you have just mentioned and therefore from that kind of a point of view you, as you very rightly said if in terms of you know many of us who are today creating solutions let's see are we really making it only for a specific market or are we really bringing in almost everybody within the market itself so this whole aspect of segmentation now need to be revisited and perhaps we need to be really talking about it from the perspective of an inclusive kind of a marketing and, and how does one really move it move the whole uh, i would say the mouse forward in that kind of a direction itself let me invite suresh over here now uh, suresh you have waited for some time but i'm sorry but i really wanted to bring you in because at this point of time we need a now a perspective on entrepreneurship but you've you given your passion for entrepreneurship at the University of Sydney. Thank you, Dr. Rajan, and it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, a big thank you to AIU and SIU for putting this together. So, as Dr. Rajan has kindly said, I have been passionate about entrepreneurship, and I'll come at it from an education perspective. And I'll take a step back and say. For me, I genuinely believe in, and uh, Dr. Abe used the word scale, so I'll use that. How do we actually create an entrepreneurship mindset at scale? And then think about, if we think of the T-shaped model, how do we work with those individuals and walk them through a journey of problem solution fit through the product market fit? So everyone gets entrepreneurial mindset skills and then for select individuals, if you want to do this at scale, how do we walk them through that entrepreneurship journey? Many of you may not appreciate that Australian universities, a single university has an amazing capacity to drive change. Why? Because we operate at a large scale compared to global universities. Sydney University, where I'm from, has 70,000 students across the board. The business school, where I'm deputy dean, itself has about 15,000 students. So if we get this right, we have an amazing capacity to drive ripples through society. So why do I think everyone needs that broad entrepreneurial mindset skills? Uh, from an Australian perspective, it's often overlooked at small to medium enterprises. Small, 0 to 90, medium, 20 to 199, contributes 54% to our GDP. So we can talk about new businesses, but what about existing SMEs? How are, they, how are we supporting them? They displayed amazing innovation and entrepreneurial skills as they pivoted through COVID. Restaurants, hairdressers, services. Many are now starting to be challenged in terms of a pivot back. What does the new future look like? So there's something here about how do we support existing businesses. 54% of Australia's GDP is reliant on this sector. Then, of course, there's new businesses. There was a Tech Council of Australia report that suggested that by 2035, new tech startups will contribute $7 billion to the Australian economy. So as we start to think about how we keep on shifting to a high-value-added economy away from resources and uh, or to diversify with resources. That's an important aspect. So we need to be thinking about existing businesses and we need to be thinking about new businesses from a national competitiveness perspective. And Australia, let's, let's actually acknowledge some of our challenges. If you look at UN and World Economic Reports, the, the report suggests Australia could do more in terms of risk appetite, risk taking. So we also need to think as universities, how do we contribute to a cultural shift across society? So that's more at a macro scale, from an economy perspective, from a social perspective. And here I must acknowledge um, Niharika's point about also driving social change in this context. And then coming back to the students. I think for students, we are increasingly seeing a greater demand uh, for non-conventional careers, wanting to shift away or at least have another alternative compared to, say, large corporates. 
And if you look at the, and I just want to call this out, if you look at sort of the, every year the World Economic Forum produces uh, future of jobs reports, and we all know the usual ones, huh? the usual ones, complex problem solving, creative thinking, analytical thinking. But number four and five out of the top skills on the rise are curiosity and lifelong learning. So there was a comment about, I think on day one, how do we future proof our students by giving them all the skills that they may need for the next 50 years? Maybe we don't need to do that, but if we can give them the capacity and capability to be curious and to acquire new skills, maybe that's important. And of course, number five, resilience, flexibility, and agility. These are all skills that you learn through pivoting, failure, learning on that entrepreneurial journey. So I put it to you that really everyone, any new student needs an entrepreneurial mindset, especially as all the data suggests, um, you know, graduates today will typically have to navigate five different careers, not jobs, five different careers. Some of us now are starting to think about one or two. Uh, these are five different careers. So that's the sort of the broad kind of foundation from which we're trying to think about how we redesign our approach to innovation entrepreneurship. So I won't replicate um, what my colleagues have spoken about. So I'll talk more about changes and challenges. So we run uh, accelerator programs, innovation programs at University of Sydney. Uh, one of the interesting things for us has been how do we do this at scale? Because it does require mentoring and support. Compared to the Ghana experience, we've taken a different approach with our academics. There are some that are absolutely passionate and will spend the time to mentor and guide our students. But practically, we know that many of academics, uh, Sydney is a research intensive university, have the challenge about balancing their time, teaching, trying to do the research and get the publications up. And then we're asking them to, to try and provide mentoring and support. So what have we done? We've gone to try and cultivate a community of entrepreneurs. So we try to access that for one of our incubators in the business school itself called Genesis. We have uh, approximately 1,500 uh, mentors who are actually people who have either gone through accelerators, have, have started up, as well as tapped into uh, an accelerator incubator community that exists in Sydney. So through our national research organization, CSIRO and others. So we've decided to try and work with a community of mentors that sits outside but adjacent to the university. And where we're trying to now work at is how do we actually help uh, incubators, get them to sort of start to think about product solution fit and then how do we actually channel them into sectors? So it's almost now a navigation function. In Sydney, we have something like 71 different startups and, and accelerators. Some are sector specific. So how do we start to take our 1500 mentors and say, okay, do we have the right mentors, the right guides to actually start to navigate or point them into particular industries or sectors so they can start to do their empathy building, their design thinking, their working with uh, potential markets to validate uh, problem statements, etc. We've also had to be incredibly critical. So, uh, and, and so we cut off. We get a lot of applications and to be honest, we only really start to provide proper support once we get to our top 15. What does that look like? That is a one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, access to cloud services, digital payment services. So we start to prepare them to go to market. Once you get to the top seven, then we bring in, if you're a B2B play, we actually bring in uh, potential clients for, through our alumni networks, so large corporates. So if it's a fintech play, we'll bring in Sydney Financial Services, so we'll bring in large banks, uh, we'll potentially bring in, bring in more mature fintech providers, etc. So we start to bring in potential, uh, potential clients or potential first revenue, uh, or even an equity stake. If it's a B2C play, it's a bit harder, we try and find what's the right channel. So what does this say from an accelerator perspective? We're trying to work downstream. The other thing I'll share from this whole, how do we do this at scale, is we've tried to also bring it upstream because we're finding a lot of our students are struggling with cost of living pressures. They're struggling with a lot of assignments already. 
So at the undergraduate level, we've created uh, a strategy, uh, an innovation on entrepreneurship area of specialization. You might think undergraduate level very early, but our bachelor's levels actually have specializations. And we recognize that actually out of school, you have a lot of students who are already starting to uh, have concepts, may already have startups, etc. So we did this. I won't replicate the conversation. I'll just say two things. It would have been very easy to do this in the business school. We actually said no. We will actually invite the whole university to design this. It took time because universities don't move quickly. Uh, and also we tend to organize by departments. So we started by bringing everyone in. And of course, STEM areas, as Paul mentioned, they all came together. But the most fantastic opportunities are when we see from our music conservatorium of music, we have people studying music and taking the entrepreneurship course. Why? Because I didn't know this. The big trend in music is not to actually play music, but to be able to digitize it for gaming, videos, etc. So if your children are playing games instead of studying the Verna or the Tabla, maybe they're already at that intersect of technology and music. That's actually where we're seeing a lot of uptake in this innovation entrepreneurship major. So uh, really doing multidisciplinary at the start. And on the point of assessments, this is a challenge for us. We are now starting to think, what does authentic assessment look like? Because students are worried about grades. You know, I haven't actually validated my concept. What does this mean from grades perspective? We have not done this yet, but in our placements, we have stopped grading and simply do pass fail as an experiment. We've just recently introduced this. We did some testing with students, whether they will, how they will react. But what we found was concern in placements. We want our students to reflect on, is this the right career or not? We want them to think about, you know, who's their network, etc. Marks were getting in the way. Will we actually bring this at scale into curriculum? I don't know. I will maybe just say one last thing. And that is, we have to think about a context. And so an overlay or quite different. For us, we've also thought about how innovation and entrepreneurship and SDGs, which I know Symbiosis also does and many universities do, how do they not only create social impact, but how do they bring people together? So we ran an Engage Asia challenge in the business school where we brought students together to apply a solve an SDG related problem, but across the context of Asia. And I'll end with this story. Great story. We had an Indian student from Chandigarh meet a computer, an engineer uh, who is a local student. They decided that the, the application for them was going to be using traffic, intelligent traffic and road data using mobile phones to try and reduce road-related injuries and fatalities uh, in India. So we had an Indian student and an Australian student, local student coming together to try and solve a problem in India. What did that do for us? Uh, we do this across uh, uh, multiple semesters. It brings people together uh, as one community and it helps to reduce differences. So I think that's a side benefit. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor. This is a wonderful example about the, the cross nationalities can work together to create a solution which might be very, very different for that. Uh, at this point of time, just before we really uh, come towards an open house, asking questions, taking up questions from everywhere, because we are running out of some bit of a time, we'll get uh, Professor Amar's presentation. So let's get Professor Amar's presentation. ...to talk about how to set the minds of students who are doing entrepreneurship and innovation. And for that, I am making use of five sutras. The first sutra says to enable students in not only interacting with computer, but being able to deploy a computer to absolve all their problems. And this will require them to have a solid foundation in science, mathematics, and technology. And then a mastery in one of the 
modern coding languages like R or Python and have comfort in deploying them. Then my second sutra talks about giving them global presence and ease to deal with the world. For that, they will have to be educated through traveling and multicultural interface. They will have to understand and learn the world. And that would mean giving them opportunity to interact with many citizens of the world through peace and friendship they can attain that global presence and that is how they will become global entrepreneurs. The third sutra talks about self-confidence. Without confidence, nothing is achieved, especially in the area of innovation and entrepreneurship. For that, they have not just to feel free, but in addition, they have to be set free right from the very beginning and freedom and independence are essential for them to build confidence. And that would mean for them to make their own decisions. We may help them if asked, and that too should not be easy. If they ask, why can't you make your decisions on your own? And then we train them in, in breaking rules, because if you stick to rules, you cannot innovate. To be able to innovate, you would have to disobey, you will have to break the rules, you will have to accept no boundaries, that means giving them adventure, letting them go on backpack trips solo and may also like to go into isolation for rejuvenation. We will then get to the fourth sutra and that requires mandatory training in AI or what we know as artificial intelligence. It is already important and has gotten its very important place in the knowledge. But in the future, no innovation shall be possible if you do not employ artificial intelligence. And that will need for us to help them and train them in dreaming fantasizing and developing ease with the unimaginative and undefined and abstract. They have to learn how to go into the unexplored territories. They should also be interacting with fiction and reading and composing fiction and drama does give them ability to go into the fantasy and dream. Word. The fifth sutra is about solidifying their roots deep in the ground and their heads high in the sky. That means giving them a kind of base and that will require us to give them ways to find answers to from where they have come and where they should go. What is real and what is fake? How to take and how to give? how to build relationships and how to avoid animosities, how to enjoy and how to mourn, how to seek refuge, how to contest and how to settle. These are like values and giving values is essential for them to really not fall to failure and we don't want them to fail. This is the reason why we will like to make sure we build their foundation and we make them strong. With that, I conclude. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So we have another about uh, 10 minutes. So we'll take some questions. Yeah, over here, the lady. Yes, in third row. Yeah. Please introduce yourself and put a direct question to the person in the panel. Sure. A very good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Aditi and I'm incubated at Symbiosis Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And I work in the sector for Indian art. And uh, I'm the director designer there. Uh, so my question is for Mr. Abhijani. Very good afternoon, sir. So uh, as a young Indian 
uh, girl and somebody who is born and brought up in this great nation i believe that uh, uh, we have a bharat before uh, any uh, encroachments and i also believe that uh, we uh, in our syllabus are still missing out on knowledge that our ancestors had before uh, you know uh, we are thousands of years of civil civilization and i believe that our ancestors had great knowledge of astronomy spirituality science maths commerce arts everything do you think our economics arts commerce everything has great takeaways to be yet added to our schools and management and actually everywhere including um, education and practices of innovation and i believe that the world would benefit the most when we learn from our past and take great knowledge forward uh, would you like to tell us about what our education system is doing about that is there a dedicated team that is trying to take uh, knowledge from the past and bring it to our modern books yeah it's a fantastic question thank you sir first the answer is yes we have a very now a dedicated cell which is called as IKS within Ministry of Education, which we IKS is Indian Knowledge System cell, and that cell is working very closely now with NCRT for curriculum design as well as textbook design, and with this new education policy, you will see all those changes happening. So within a year, you will see a lot of these things inculcated. For example, I will give you. How, what we can learn from our IKS when it comes to innovation, you know. I was actually looking at some of the uh, real good case studies. And the best case study I could find from IKS was Sushrut's case study. And it was related to surgery, you know. So, when I was going through Sushrut manual, I actually saw various uh, devices uh, for which they had designed for taking incision, you know, and it, the inspiration for those <coughs> knives or those uh, incision uh, devices were taken from the tooths of various uh, animals so that an incision device inspired from a fox tooth was used for a different for making the uh, taking incision on a different part of a body than an incision device which was inspired from tiger tooth or a lion tooth because the kind of flesh and the kind uh, the uh, the kind of incision which you can take was very very different it's a very good case i am not a doctor to be very honest with you but when i actually saw that uh, that these were the inspirations, these were, uh, and actually our uh, Vaidyas used it for uh, in real life surgeries for taking incisions, you know, and devices were developed and Shushrut has given real good uh, pictorial representations of those devices. So there are lots, lot of such case studies which are there, then purifying zinc, you know, and I, I, again, I can go on and on and on. So uh, what I want to say is that these case studies are going to get introduced uh, within our syllabus. Yes, you will see something really amazing happening. Yeah, here. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my question is again to Jerry, sir. Uh, 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 is there any schemes available to government of India for scaling, scaling of uh, the businesses of, um, of startups. I'm co-founder and direct pro, uh, director of Sugamya Digital Solutions, a startup company. There are multiple such schemes which are there for uh, businesses uh, which we are funding. Uh, and uh, almost every ministry has its own fund uh, for startups. As AICT, we also are funding around 100 startups. Uh, we are giving projects with uh, good uh, at maybe TRL six and above. That is technology with six and above, uh, uh, up to ten lakh rupees. Apart from that, Ministry of Social Justice, Ministry of Disabilities, Ministry of MSME, Science and Technology Ministry. 
all almost all of them uh, have funds for startups apart from the main startup in dsl you know so what i believe is that you can certainly approach uh, these ministries look into the schemes and apply thank you let me just come to this the, the gentleman over here can you just uh, give this just one minute sir just just, just one minute just one yeah good afternoon i am dr jaydeep proudhary from vidyanagar south gujarat university surat uh, my question is to dr abhay jere uh, as per numerous reports uh, the success rate in startup in india is around less than 10% less than 10% uh, so uh, how do we improve that success rate what can we do uh, so so yes you're right when it comes to student startups the success rate could be as low as 2% or 3% uh, but that's the way the journey is going to be the systems are going to evolve you know there are large number of people who have got into startups because of the buzz around startups you know and uh, that happened in silicon valley also initially with the uh, that there is value of death which you call you know it's a, it's a, so that was high but eventually the ecosystem matures Uh, eventually the investor mature mm. uh, where to invest where not to invest what i have realized and the reason why i am telling you uh, why we are failing many of the startups uh, is that large number of startups which actually come from students or youngsters are mm. more of a technology focused or technology centric startups mm. rather than problem centric okay. startups means what if i know ai or if i know blockchain i try to apply it everywhere you know i will apply blockchain finance everyone knows but then i will try to apply blockchain in aviation i will try to apply blockchain in uh, agriculture or food processing and i have actually been to many of these innovation uh, contests where people have invented solutions for problems which never existed <laughs> you know uh, uh, and uh, and because of that uh, that's one aspect you know so jaha talwar chahiye wa talwar chahiye ya sui chahiye wa sui chahiye you know that kind of a thing uh, so uh, just knowing uh, um, or having expertise in ai ml or uh, blockchain or all these again buzzwords you know because of this buzzwords uh, so uh, many of these startups are failing one second the reason the startups are failing is because there is very less emphasis on design you know if you see the products which are getting developed by our students the idea is good many times but no focus on ergonomics miniaturization uh, product engineering material sciences and so on and so forth so they end up looking very shabby and if you have to really compete and if somebody has to buy those products so tali bajane ke liye ye innovations bahut acche hote hain but nobody is ready to put hand in their pocket to actually buy those products so emphasis on design also is very very important and actually tomorrow that is the reason even prime minister is pushing us and tomorrow we are actually starting a boot camp on design because innovators need to be told that boss great idea is but just not enough it has to be combined or blended with great design you know right yeah I have just one minute. Just one time. Come. I I I, I hope no, not all, all questions are not directed. To no, me. that's what I am going to do to address to the entire no. panel. I we are going to we are going to just one minute. We are going to take after him another two questions because the time is also now running out. Yeah. I am Dr. Amrindra Pani. I am heading the research and policy planning division of Association of Indian Universities, and I have a practical experience to share with the entire panel. In fact, Unvision is a platform provided by AIU. Probably, Avaji ke saath humne share kiya tha. We had shared this idea through letters with Avaji. In fact, Unvision was introduced in 2007, sir. And we invite innovative research projects in five areas: basic science, engineering, uh, technology. Please, please just put a question. Yeah, my question. Yeah, my yeah. question please is, put a question because we, we are have, running out of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have produced a lot of students, those who come to that Unvision, and they have taken part. they have uh, really, really created so many innovative things projects how can we collaborate with uh, aict ministry uh, this innovation cell and to all the university representatives sitting here that's just the point i want to explore thank you very much so you have any one of you who would like to take take this up as a question 
it is in terms of how does one bring the partnership in some of these initiatives that have been taken at the more macro level like the Association of Indian Universities or the AICTE, etc. <coughs> yeah, please go ahead, Paul. I guess I would say as a first observation that we know that our universities already have very strong partnerships for research, student exchange, student mobility. And I think what we're starting to see is a trend towards bringing this kind of opportunity for students into those partnership discussions. And I think that's really positive. And I think the example that's Suresh cool. gave of you know, entrepreneurship with a focus on bringing together students from different countries. We're seeing that starting to happen and I think we have to build on those partnerships and recognise that this is a global ecosystem that we're working in. But we have, we have the foundations, I think. I would just, I just want to add that um, in Australia we have Victorian government, which is one of the state governments, New South Wales government. They also are investing on regional agencies, which basically have entrepreneurs from that region. Um, the resources are also available for international collaborations. So perhaps at you know the state level or maybe at national level, uh, maybe those agencies can also start talking to each other because right now the individual universities are doing the collaborations for mobility and for entrepreneurial collaborations. Yeah, we, we come, come over here. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm Dr. Mona Shah. Uh, Dr. Jere, I will not address this question to you, but you will need to take the answer in some form. This is for the whole. <laughs> this is okay. for the whole panel. Uh, Dr. Rosamond, I have been a, a, a uh -huh. career academic, but I gave that up for entrepreneurship. That's why I'm in this session. And I do believe that we can really make a change, and sometimes much more if we are outside the system than in it. And uh, we need to have a place because when we are out of the university, uh, university system, we might feel as if we are pariahs, you know, because we are neither here nor there, but we have a lot of ideas, a lot of innovation capacity, which has not gone. It just doesn't want to be framed in, you know, specific silos. So all of you sitting here, I have seen a, an experiment which, is, which my son is undergoing in uh, UK where he graduated from the London School of Economics, but he is maintained by, uh, he is mentored by a UCL, uh, you know, startup uh, incubation, where they don't think of university as a silo, like LSE will not work for, uh, with UCL, no such thing happens. His startup visa has been given by LSE in UK. I'm asking this whole panel, when can our Indian students begin to work with Ghana, begin to work with Australia, from the universities here, from the departments that he heads, I think that is something that we should be going to because these minds, these young minds, don't understand borders. Right, right. Okay. Uh, Any one of you would like to take it up? The borderless? Uh, yes. So, uh, I, I'll give examples because I've collaborated with quite a number of universities from the U.S. and Germany. And what we do is that we try to bring the students as part of the project. We try to bring students together for them to come up with various ideas. And we've done that. It's just that we're not able to move it further because of maybe time zones and everybody is busy. But I think we can go back and look, look at that. And to add to your example, for instance, my son did computer science and he's doing a virtual internship with Tata, Tata Consultancy Services. And, and I believe that with the advent of ICT, we'll be able to do some of those things even when we are further away. So yes, through collaborations between universities and professors. And the examples I gave in terms of the innovations by the professors, those innovations came about through collaboration with other colleagues in other universities. And I believe that uh, no, no, no one has all the knowledge uh, under the sun. And I always say that when you want to get an assemble of an assembly of the best brains on this earth, it is the universities you get them. And therefore, there is a need for us to use whatever we have collaborate, share ideas, so that we make the world a better place like what we had this morning. Thank you. Just very quick, uh, very quickly, I will say, I think there's a lot of intent and appetite for collaboration. 
but um, using the words, this can't be a solution looking for a problem. We really need to make sure that there's a rationale for coming together. What is the complementarity? Thank you. I think, uh, just one minute, please. I think there's a lot of interest in this group. I would urge you all to take up everything with the panelists offline, off the session, offline itself. Everybody is going to be available on the lunchtime. Kindly just, just, just go there, talk to them. And certainly I'm pretty confident that each one of them would be more than happy to really respond. Yogesh, over to you. So much, sir. And what a fantastic panel. Can we have a round of applause for all the panelists here? <laughs> Pleasure to have all of you here. And what a dynamic discussion. We could not take some questions, so we are really very sorry for it. Maybe somewhere in the lunchtime we can catch up with the panelists. Um, but I'd come to your question uh, very quickly while wrapping up. If I look at Suresh uh, and Dr. Jere, it's more about, I think, multidisciplinary approach. Uh, if you look at Niharika, uh, of course, DEI and Niharika, definitely uh, today we are six panelists, two of them are women. <laughs> Next time, Dr. Saxena, we'll have four by two. <laughs> Maybe you can take it as a promise. Yeah. So, uh, no offense, uh, Paul. <laughs> So more focus on product uh, and future innovations, uh, that is what Paul and research. University is coming together for innovation research and facilitating the entrepreneurial ecosystem in in the universities. Dr. Jerry, of course, uh, again, Suresh and Dr. Jerry, if you look at, it's about scaling the initiative, like how you can actually impact 1,000, uh, 100,000 students in one go, like something like an hackathon or the model of institution, innovation council, IICs, that created a very different uh, momentum in the country and all thanks to Dr. Jere and his office. Okay, one of its kind, like what he said that this model doesn't exist anywhere in the world. Yeah, and of course, Dr. Saxena, the chair of the panel. We had around like 40, 45 minutes discussion yesterday and I learned a lot from the panel yesterday. Uh, focus on social entrepreneurship and how university can drive uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, even in faculty members. So, uh, I'll, not, I'll not stand much between you, all of you, and lunch, but we'd like to uh, thank the panelists and uh, felicitate the panelists. And we heard uh, Dr. Amar, so it's all about breaking the rules. So in the last five minutes, okay, I've been talking to the organizers for breaking the rules and felicitating by uh, multiple people here. So I'd like to felicitate uh, the panel through my entrepreneurs who have incubated their startups in the center. And of course, uh, the senior most uh, dean present uh, here in the audi uh, audience. So we'll start with uh, Niharika. Uh, just one minute, just one. Yes, sir. Let me thank, uh, on behalf of all of you, the entire panel, which is uh, which I'm sure you would agree. So a wonderful panel, Brian, their experiences, they are all sharing their experiences. And certainly this wouldn't have been a wonderful session without each one of you. So I'd like you all to clap for yourself because this was a wonderful session having each one of you all. Thank you. If, if we did not have these kinds of wonderful questions, I don't think so that this, this session would have been of any use. Thank you. And thank you, panelists. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah. Uh, may I request Aditi Khoth, founder Des Rangila, to felicitate Niharika, please. Adi is an entrepreneur here at Symbiosis, running a very unique startup called Desrangila. And all of you can understand, sir, we are in business of business, so definitely I will showcase my startups. <laughs> I request Dr. Prajakta Insulkar to felicitate Rosamund. And there is a coconut relationship, that's the reason. She runs a startup in coconut. Yeah. Maybe we can see some collaboration in future. Yeah. May I request Mr. Pratap Pawar, who runs a company called Guruji Education, to felicitate Paul. He's running three companies at this age, 27. Yeah. May I request Jaydeep. Uh, to felicitate Suresh. Jaydeep runs a very unique agri-based tech platform where his wife is co-founder. So very few of us are able to get this, right? Your wife as a co-founder. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 
And we have Dr. Gurupur, Dean Faculty of Law, Sebastian International University. May I request Dr. Gurupur to felicitate Dr. Abhay Jayde. Dr. Gurupur is also a uh, Jain Monet Chair Professor and collaborating uh, very dynamically and internationally, uh, Dr. Jayde. Thank you so much, sir. I request Dr. Gurupur again to felicitate the chair of the session, Dr. Rajan Saxena. Thank you so much. I'll just come in 15 seconds, I'll come to question asked by ma'am uh, on internationalization of when we are going to Nigeria, Ghana or Africa. Pratap, if you can stand, there is a startup and Symbiosis uh, Institute of Technology student. He was just walking in our center just to talk to us as it looks a colorful building. He got informal interaction. Today, he is working with this startup. He is recruited, recruited as director Nigeria, taking Guruji Education, this company, to Nigeria. And he is responding to Nigeria. Yeah. Oh my God. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you so much, all the panelists, uh, for uh, maybe taking us to a very different uh, level of thought process. And Dr. Rajan Saxena, one thing I think we will look for is coming from you because he's, he's called as marketing guru. I think uh, we did not go into that introduction of this calling called as marketing guru of uh, this region of world. Okay, uh, we have been going through your books, sir, uh, after Kotler uh, when we read. So, inclusive marketing something we will look forward uh, for you and I think on this note we can close. Thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. Okay. We'll have a group photo please here. Yeah.